Hey everyone, okay, I'm doing this especially for Barry and for Patrick because I want to show them some of the photos that I managed to get from Armed Forces Day, which was on Saturday. It was an absolutely fantastic day out. Um, but it also got me to thinking where these weapons came from. And when you actually see some of the weapons that are there, you can see how these weapons have evolved down the line. So things such as crossbow, archery, you know, it, it, it becomes the machine guns that we use today. And I'll explain this more as we go along. Um, it's just a little video I've put together for everyone so that you can have a little bit of a history lesson and hopefully enjoy. So here goes. I hope you enjoy. Thanks. Throughout the ages, our fascination with weaponry has been a source of man's ever-growing evolution. The macabre truth is, there is one thing that man is excessively good at, and that is killing each other. Throughout thousands of years, our small island nation has seen invaders from all over the globe. We have fought to protect it, and we have fought to protect our allies. Regardless of our thoughts of the current political situation, there is one thing we can all agree with. This is a great land and we should all be willing to protect it. The art and beauty we all find in weaponry should come as no surprise. From the early Celts to the Roman invasion, weapons have played a fundamental part in man's evolution, and they have not only died by each other's hands, but they have been taught by each other's hands as well. An example of weaponry and evolution can be found with a long piece of wood we all know to be a bow. The evolution of the bow can even be seen in some of the modern guns we use today. Taking the small piece of wood to another level, the crossbow was a simple design. But the Romans, as the Romans do, decided to take it a step further. Machines were developed to make the task effortless. These machines could be operated by just about anyone with very little training. They could be pivoted to face towards the enemy as they raged towards you. Whilst the machine was brutal, it didn't seem enough for them, and soon enough it evolved again to fire up to 30 arrows in a single shot. Some could even fire up to 100. Meanwhile in the east, a new machine was being developed. The flaming arrows hurling towards you at tremendous speed were terrifying, but the damage they could inflict didn't seem like enough for the innovative Chinese. A new idea was born, taking the evolution of weapons to a whole new level. By using black powder, they would fire from these machines what appeared to look like very early versions of rockets. A new age was born. Firepower had arrived. However, it wasn't until the 13th century that the idea came into force to develop guns. As we wander through the evolution of weapons and the evolution of Britain, there are several weapons which stand out for me personally. Whilst many wouldn't look to horses as a weapon, the cavalry and their horses were used right the way through history, all the way to the First World War. Even today these loyal beasts play a fundamental part in the armed forces. By the side of the horse is my personal favourite, one of the most primitive weapons we have to date, the sword. Still used today in ceremony, originally cast from bronze, they were a terrifying weapon to be faced with on the field of battle. However, bronze would bend easily and often break. The iron sword soon followed, but as the Romans invaded Britain in 43 AD, they brought with them a knowledge of weaponry like no other. The gladius was soon born to Britain. The arena of Roman gladiators soon opened throughout the vast expanse of the Roman Empire. Blood was a sport to them. Death was nothing more than a slight loss of a slave. The gladiators would fight in the arena for freedom and for money, but mostly it was for the glory. These men were revered as mighty warriors. Their sweat would be sold to those who wished to have their bravery. And there are some accounts of women taking on the role of gladiator. Whilst these are rare, the Roman invasion of Britain was a shocking time for the Romans. 
Having fought so long, it was a rare thing for them to find that the people they referred to as barbaric had armies of both men and women. In the ancient world of the Celts, women were equal to men, with many of their tribal leaders being female. The Romans must have been astounded by this. It wasn't until 61 AD that Queen Boudicca led warriors of the Essene tribe to rise up against the tyranny of the Romans, but the Celts fell against the Roman might. It wasn't until 410 AD that the Romans finally withdrew from Britain, leaving her open to the Anglo-Saxons to settle. Britain was again at war. With the Roman army all gone, all they had left were their skill and a few Roman guards. The Anglo-Saxons dominated the British landscape from around 450 to around 750 AD. It was a time of warriors, war and tribes. However, the Anglo-Saxons didn't bring as much greed and terror to Britain as many would believe. They had laws, many of which were derived from Roman law, but still they did have a hierarchy. The country was split into kingdoms with ruling kings, each one held a true part in the change Britannia was going through. The next change for Britannia came less than 50 years later. In 793 AD, a visitor landed on our shores. Brutal killers came from the east. They took everything they wanted and left nothing behind apart from themselves. The Vikings had arrived. These men and women brought customs and traditions of a different nature. Whilst they are often referred to as barbaric, remains of such acts have never truly been found. An invasion is a very messy thing, and it is widely believed through historical societies that Vikings weren't the vicious killers ancient scholars would have us believe. They brought us poetry, such as Beowulf. And whilst the Vikings settled in Britain, there is proof that they became a more peaceful people, living side by side with the Celts, who had now almost died out. It was there that they remained until the year of 1066, a year which has become best known upon our shores, the Norman invasion. Britain would never be the same again. Castles began to dominate the lands. Large towns and cities began to appear. Civilization had changed again. For over 400 years, Britannia belonged to the Normans. Their need for bigger and better tore down woodland and forest. The land was quickly changing. But in 1455, another change occurred, bringing us towards the Britain we know today. Again, Britain was at war and the War of the Roses didn't end until 1485 when Richard III was defeated by Henry Tudor. Thus, the Age of the Tudor began. The Victorian age began with Queen Alexandrina Victoria as she ascended the throne in the age of 18 in 1837. By this time the British military had gone through some considerable changes. The Romans brought a knowledge of weapons and war. The Anglo-Saxons brought a community of fighters. The Vikings brought warriors, although Britain still hadn't finished evolving. A bitter war was about to begin. But this wasn't a war fought on our shores. A new empire had stretched as far as China and it was being threatened. Along its evolution, Britannia had collected some grateful allies. And on the 28th of July, 1914, Britain had to rise up. Taking the knowledge of a thousand years of war, the Great War began. Until its end on the 11th of November, 1914, Britain fought for its allies, to keep its people free and to keep its lands peaceful. But again, this was not to last. For the next 20 years, Britannia recovered from the Great War. But on the 1st of September, 1939, again Britain was at war. With over 1 million serving from 30 different countries, Britain took centre stage on defeating the common enemy. Upon the world's podium stood a man of true valour, our Prime Minister, 
Sir Winston Churchill. You ask, what is our policy? It is to wage war by sea, land and air, with all our might and with all the strength God can give us. To wage war against a monstrous tyranny never surpassed in the darkened catalogue of human crime. That is our policy. You ask, what is our aim? Uh, I can answer in one word. Victory. Victory at all costs. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory, however long and hard the road may be. For without victory, there is no survival. The Battle of France is over. And the Battle of Britain is about to begin. Soon the whole fury and might of the enemy will be turned upon us. We have before us an ordeal of the most grievous kind. We have before us many, many long months of struggle and of suffering. We shall go on to the end. We shall fight on the seas and the oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and with growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds, we shall fight in the fields, we shall fight in the streets, we shall fight in the hills, we shall never surrender. Upon this battle depends the future of all civilization. Hitler knows that he will have to break us in this island or lose the war. If we can stand up to him, then all of Europe may be free. But if we fail, then the whole world, including the United States, including all that we've known and cared for, will sink into the abyss of a new dark age. Let us therefore brace ourselves together and so bear ourselves that the British Empire and its Commonwealth last for a thousand years. Men will still say, this was their finest hour. Our small island has gone through so many changes. Even today, we continue to see her change. Britannia has stood proud through tyranny and greed. She has survived conquest and she has survived war. However, the war didn't end with the Second World War. In 1982, Britain was again at war in the Falklands. The Gulf War in 1992 and in 2003, Britain was again at war in the Falklands and also in Iraq. Until today, our brave soldiers fight for freedom and not only ours, but they fight for peace for those who do not know what true peace is. There is one thing I need to mention as we go through the history and evolution of Britain and her ever-evolving weapons. It wasn't until 1696 that women were allowed to join the military in Britain, but they would serve as North nurses and laundresses on hospital ships. But due to arguments with their pay being equal to able seamen, these roles were soon abolished. We next see women appear in the armed forces in 1884. They were employed as nurses to the Royal Navy. These women paved the way for women in the armed forces and finally, in 1902, the Queen Alexandra's Royal, Royal Nursing Corps was founded. Come the Second World War, more than 600,000 women were serving in three walks of the military. The Royal Air Force, the Territorial Army and the Women's Royal Navy. Today, women in the armed forces can be found in all roles except those whose primary duty is to close with and kill the enemy, such as infantry, household cavalry, Royal Armoured Corps, Royal Marine Commandos, RAF regiments, special air services and special boat services. Whilst the history of weapons has evolved, the mentality of the armed forces has arguably devolved and is now following a new path of evolution. And right up until today, women have played a fundamental role in the success of the armed forces, but mostly in the evolution of Britain herself. The 
this terrifying account of weapons throughout the ages brings to mind the struggle man has always suffered. If it is peace you want, you must be willing to die for it. Which brings us back to today's events. The men and women who we were there to support today have made the ultimate sacrifice. They are willing to lie down their lives for you and me. They fight so we can know freedom. In times of peril, there is one thing that this great island nation seems to stand out for. Shoulder to shoulder, we will stand and support our troops. The Day of the Armed Forces is there to commemorate those who gave their lives in battle and those who served so others can know peace. Men and women across the world take the oath to protect their country against all evils, foreign and domestic. They sacrifice their tomorrow so we can have our today. And for that, I thank them. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that. I didn't know it was going to take that long, I'm really sorry, but hopefully you got a little bit of a history lesson and a little bit more about me and why I'm so fascinated with bows and swords and the, the weapons of the ancient times. So, yes, I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you all soon. Bye!